And Brahman was, came to see the Buddha and asked him, please do away with my perplexity. And the Buddha said, nobody can do away with anyone else's perplexity. Sounds kind of discouraging. You come to the Buddha hoping to have things cleared up, and you would get them cleared up, but that wouldn't solve the problem in your heart totally. You would have to take those teachings and put them to practice. It's only when you test things for yourself that your perplexity ends. The Buddha tells you how. The things you assume, the techniques you try. And even when you have belief in what he has, what he has to say, it doesn't end your perplexity. It's only when you put these things into practice that you see, okay, this works, this works, this works. And you've developed your own abilities to judge things properly. In other words, you, other words, you have to get the mind to a point where it really can trust its evaluation of what works. And that's when the perplexity is done. To overcome your doubt, overcome your uncertainty. The Buddha said to pay attention to what's, as he said, dark and bright in the mind, what's skillful and unskillful. Pay appropriate attention to these things. In other words, when a mind state comes up, you can't go by your likes or dislikes. You can't just watch them come and go. You have to watch when they come, what comes along with them, and when they go, what do they do? What impact do they have before they go? And the Buddha himself said he got on the right path when he could divide his thoughts into ones that were skillful and ones that were not. Once he noticed something, when he thought it was going to lead to harm, either for himself or for other people, notice that harm. It's not a question of whether it hurts their feelings or not, or whether they like it or not. But do these thoughts actually lead to harm? A lot of times when you're, say your sensual desires are going to get other people involved in sensual misconduct, that's for their harm. Or when your passion or aversion are intended to give rise to passion or aversion in other people, okay, that's causing harm to yourself and to others. But you know, if, it, if there was that kind of thought, then you would have to keep it in check. You can't just watch things come and go. Watching things come and go, they call it bare attention, but it's actually, in the Buddhist terms, inappropriate attention. If you don't have the purpose of figuring out when something is unskillful, then you've got to do something about it. Appropriate attention is said to be basically the seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths and figuring out what the duty is with regard to them. And when stress or suffering comes, that's to be comprehended. You've got to look and see what is actually the suffering there in the mind. You have to ferret it out. As the Buddha said, it's, it's something that's not obvious, clinging to the five aggregates. If you go down and ask the ordinary person on the street about suffering, they, it's very rare that you'd find someone who would answer that way. They have all kinds of other ideas. To comprehend it, you have to really look carefully at it and see, okay, this is what is lies at the essence of the suffering in the mind, and it is that clinging. All too often we see the suffering, but we don't see the clinging. So that's something you have to look for to comprehend. Once you see it, you have to figure out what's causing it. You let that go so you can realize the cessation of suffering. And to do this, you've got to develop certain qualities of the path. That's called looking at things with appropriate attention. So when something unskillful arises in the mind, okay, the appropriate thing to do is figure out how to let go of it, how to abandon it. As the Buddha said, when unskillful thoughts came into his mind, he would hold them in check in the same way that during the rainy season when rice is growing in the fields and you've got cows, they're going to be tempted to go into the fields and eat the rice. And if they do, you're going to get into trouble. So you've got to keep the cows out of the rice and do everything you can to keep them out of the rice. It says you, you check them and you hit them and you poke them. And it's the same with unskillful thoughts. 
first off, you've got to recognize them and then figure, okay, I just can't sit here wallowing in these thoughts. I've got to figure out some way to stop them. And you can't use just plain willpower. You've got to develop all the factors of the path, from right view all the way down to right concentration. As for skillful thoughts, you encourage them. Oh, as the Buddha noticed, you can think some skillful things that are not involved in any sensual desire, not involved in ill will, not involved in harmfulness. But sitting and thinking them for a long period of time can tire you out. So it's even more skillful to bring the mind to concentration. So we do this. Even though it hasn't been proven to us beyond a doubt that this is going to work, still it makes sense. And we've had some taste that some of these things seem to work. So let's pursue them. Because doubts are already going to be in your practice all the way up to stream entry. But that's the point where your doubts and your perplexity are gone. But as the Buddha said, he can't do that for you. You've got to do the work. And you've got to take on all the working hypotheses that help to see if they really do work. We're talking today about rebirth. And the Buddha didn't say that he could prove it to anybody, but he did say many, many times that if you take it as, an, as a hypothesis, you're going to be a lot more likely, especially take the teaching and rebirth together with karma, you're going to be a lot more likely to be careful about your actions and be more motivated to look carefully at your actions. Because it's only in looking at your own actions that your perplexity is going to be done. So the teachings that encourage you to take your actions seriously, those are the ones that you take on. And say, I'm going to test these. Let's see what this does for my mind. Let's see what this does for the level of pleasure and pain, the level of suffering or well-being that you're going to be experiencing. At the same time, you develop the discernment that allows you to catch yourself when you're lying to yourself. This is one of the big problems in ending your perplexity, is figuring out why is the mind lying to you. The problem is that all too often we like the lies. I mean, you look at political campaigns. Politicians have learned that you can lie to people, and they're perfectly happy to be lied to as long as it's a lie that feeds some other agenda they've got. Or you can look at relationships. A lot of times relationships are built on lies, and people turn, will turn a blind eye to them. Years back, I remember, going on an alms round in Thailand, there was a period there was a song that was very popular, and you heard it almost every day. And one of the lines was this guy is singing, and he says, no matter how far away that star is, if you want it, I'll go out and get it and I'll put it in your hand. It was obvious he's lying. Yeah, you know, it's the kind of thing people like to hear. So it's not just and it's not just between people, it's the mind lying to itself. And so this is why you're encouraged from the very beginning in the Buddha's very first instructions to his son. Where there's no quality of a contemplative in someone who tells a deliberate lie. If you find it easy to lie to other people, you're going to lie to yourself. So truthfulness is where the practice begins. And you just have to muster as much as your truthfulness as you can, as you practice. And if your mindfulness develops and your discernment develops, you'll, you'll catch yourself lying to yourself on more and more subtle things. That's when you really begin to see the power of the path. So the perplexity is not something someone else can clear up for you. I mean, you can listen to a Dharma talk and some issues may get cleared up. You can begin to see, okay, this is how this makes sense or how that makes sense or how this connects with that or how you might be able to get around this particular problem. But you still don't know for sure until you actually do it. 
The Buddha says that one of the rewards of listening to the Dharma is that you clear up your, your doubts. But that's if you're actually doing in your mind what the talk is about. If it's just words coming in and you don't act on the words, they're going to stay just words. No matter how true they may be, they're still just words as far as you're concerned until you actually put them into practice. And see what works and what doesn't. And to see what does it mean for something to work and not to work. How well do that things have to work before they really count as working? The Buddha's idea of what works is a lot higher than most people's. So your question is, do you want to raise your standards to his? He sets out the path with a lot of clarity. But it's still not clear in your mind until you've actually put it into, put, put it into the test. I've been reading about people saying that when the Buddhist first started teaching, his, his teachings were quite vague. And he didn't want to be too precise because the truth that he had awakened to was not easily put into words. And so he left things vague. And if we want to be in line with his original teachings, we have to let the teachings be vague as well. Well, that's not helpful at all. One of the primary features of the Buddhist tradition. It's a point that the Buddha made one time. He said that there's a difference between an assembly that's trained in cross-questioning and an assembly that's trained in bombast. The one trained in bombast is where the teacher just says lovely things that may be vague, but the teacher doesn't allow you to ask what, what they mean, and you're not supposed to ask what they mean. Just enjoy the, the beauty of the words and let yourself feel inspired to interpret them, interpret them any way you like. Whereas the assembly trained in cross-questioning says, okay, what does this mean? What does that mean? How far does this, the meaning of this go? How should I take this? And again, the teacher is there to clear things up as much as possible so you can get an idea. This is how you test the teachings. This is what the teachings are proposing. This is how you test them. And the more clarity you can get from the teacher that way, the the more you have something to put your hands on, you can actually test it. So the Buddha was not the sort of person just to leave things vague. I mean, there are times when he spoke cryptically, but that was to make you think. But he was always open to questioning, even up, even up to the last night of his life, before he gave his final teaching. He asked, are there any questions? And he asked it three or four times just to make sure. He was that earnest in wanting things to be as clear as possible. So that when you were testing something, you knew what you were testing. But as for your own perplexity about it, does this really work? Okay, that's up to you. So try to develop in your mind the qualities that allow you to test things and come out with a reliable judgment. That's a lot of what the meditation is all about. A lot of us come to the meditation just so we can have a place to relax and put down our burdens. And that is an important part of concentration, but there's more. Once the mind is rested, you realize it still has work to do. And this is where it lies, in learning how to check where you're still uncertain about things as to what really is skillful in life. It's not easy work, but it's good work. Because the mind with no perplexity is a mind with no suffering. <laughs>